Another episode of Words of Grace starts now. Featuring a new, grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. Hello and welcome. It is great to be with you for part three of the Evolution of Worship series. You might have noticed I've had to go so quickly through the material. I wish I had more time to spend with each week that we gather. Uh, that's why I highly recommend The Evolution of Worship, the book that's available on Amazon, because it spends more time going through each chapter, each week that we spend together. So today we're going to be talking about worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's the change from Old Testament worship to New Testament worship. Now, the change in worship from how Old Testament saints were able to worship to what has happened to us as New Testament believers was made available and actually prophesied by Jesus through an interaction that he had with a Samaritan woman at a well. In John chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, it says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus' response would have surprised this woman. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, John 4.21. The answer is surprising because before, the place of worship used to matter. Jerusalem was the place to go for worship. The Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy are commanded to worship Yahweh not in the way that the Canaanites did. We discover this in Deuteronomy 12.4. And the way the Canaanites worship would have been in multiple places, which the Israelites are commanded to, to destroy. But only at his one chosen place are they to worship God. So now you are telling us the place of worship won't matter anymore? This is another fact of what made Jesus' interaction with this woman about worship all the more remarkable. Now, despite the custom of the Jews of the day to avoid any contact with the Samaritans, whom they perceived as spiritually inferior people, Jesus does. John 4, 9b, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How could you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now the footnote notes that Jews would not use dishes that Samaritans had used, like the cup Jesus was asking to drink from. There were societal rules in place. A rabbi would never speak with a woman alone. Jews would never drink after Samaritans because Jews despise Samaritans. Now, the historical reason for this goes back to the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel. After the Assyrians had captured Israel in 722 to 721 BC, they did as they deported all the Israelites of substance and settled the land with foreigners. And these foreigners would intermarry with the surviving Israelites and this new group of people that were created would adhere to some form of the ancient religion. We discover this in 2 Kings chapter 17 through 18. Now after the exile of the southern kingdom in Babylon, the Jews returning to their homeland would view this new people group, Samaritans, as children of political rebels and racial half-breeds whose religion had become tainted by unaccepted elements of worship. In about 400 BC, the Samaritans also erected a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Jesus' interaction with this woman who was only half Jewish showed how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Acts 10 34. And that worship would be open to all people for the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. In fact, God so loved the Samaritans 
this despised half Jew, half Gentile group of people that at the height of Jesus' surging popularity, John 4, 1, God sends him away from the crowds of people for just this one Samaritan woman. It's a beautiful illustration of our shepherd leaving behind the 99 for the one lost sheep and also how God's flock is larger than just the Jewish people. Jesus answers, Jesus answers, the place is not going to matter where we worship. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Together, the words spirit and truth mean that real worship comes from the spirit within, and it's based on true views of God that Jesus is our Messiah. Understand that in the Old Testament, up until this point, the presence of God is behind a dividing curtain in the temple. It's called the veil. Only the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement can make an animal sacrifice for the sins of the Jewish nation. A rope would be tied around his waist because when he goes into the Holy of Holies, if he makes a mistake, he would die instantly. And they needed a way to retrieve the body. This had to be done year after year because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away a person's sin forever. Hebrews 10, 2 through 4. But Jesus, who is our great high priest, made it possible for our sins to be taken away forever when he died on the cross. When Jesus died, something incredible happens. That curtain, the veil separating us from God's presence is torn, and it symbolizes that God is now accessible to everybody, even Samaritans who have been married five times. When Jesus becomes our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. Now we worship God in spirit through the Holy Spirit in us as we have received the truth, Jesus Christ. What is also fascinating in the story is where this event takes place at, where Jesus is when he makes this amazing declaration of how worship is about to change. So he came to a town in Samaria, and this, this town that he came to was near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. We discover that Jacob's well is located here. And Jesus, it says in the text, as he was tired from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. You can visit this well even today. So here is a picture of Jacob's well. This is a historical site from the Old Testament. Jesus is at a monument, but not just any monument, a monument that's actually mentioned all the way back in Genesis thirty-three nineteen. Jacob had bought this field, and he bought it for 100 pieces of silver or lambs, Genesis thirty-three nineteen tells us, and in it he built an altar, which he dedicated to Elohi Yisrael, the strong God, the covenant God of Israel. And so what covenant would they celebrate and make an altar for? It would have been the Abrahamic covenant. In the previous uh, time together, we saw how altars and monuments were a form of worship. So we can say that Jesus is at an Old Testament monument of worship, declaring the change of worship to come that will be a part of keeping the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, I will make you a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through Jesus Christ, all the nations are blessed. And what I had just read was the Abrahamic 
part of the Abrahamic covenant that God made to Abraham. So the promise of the blessing, Jesus, has arrived at the altar that is dedicated to the covenant-keeping God of Israel who made this promise that he's going to bless the whole world through the messianic lineage. You want to talk about a grand announcement. The covenant fulfiller has arrived. God the Father led Jesus the Son to meet a Samaritan woman at the God-honoring altar that says God fulfills his covenant with his people. It is well documented that the woman at the well had a past that she was not proud of. So Jesus said to her, You're right when you said you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. Jesus actually shows this woman both grace and truth, for that is who he is, so that she might come to know him for who he truly is. She says, I know that Messiah called Christ. Christ is uh, the word for Messiah. It's not Jesus' last name, in case you were wondering. Christ means Messiah. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus' response to the woman who has had five husbands is correctly translated, you have beautifully said you have no husband. This is the first compliment that Jesus gives her. Adultery is wrong, and Jesus' grace is what will bring this woman out of it. She's in the presence of the one who knows all about her sin, but yet he did not judge her for it. The second compliment comes, you aren't even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Jesus, who is the grace of God, lifted her up. We know the woman was at the well at noon, John 4, 6. The well was a place to gather socially. If you didn't want to socialize or perhaps something embarrassing or has happened in your life, or maybe your life has been a disappointment up until this point, you go to the well when no one else would be there. Noon was the hottest part of the day, and drawing heavy water in the, hardest the hottest part of the day, who does that? <laughs> no one except those who are trying to avoid others. She must have been a little surprised to find that Jesus was there. It was her past that had caused her shame, but it is grace it is exactly what she needs. It's exactly what ashamed people need is the grace of God. If you have a troubled past, it is the grace of God that will remove your shame as he offers you his life in exchange for yours. Jesus is the key to unlocking your worship. The genius of Jesus is that he meets every one of us at our point of need. The self-righteous need the law to expose their need for a savior. What the hurting need is grace. You don't need the law to tell you that you've made mistakes. You need the supernatural grace of God that will empower you to sin no more. It's a revelation of God our Father who loves us and does not treat us as our sins deserve as we receive the gift of his son. That is what this woman needed. When the woman finally sees Jesus for who he is, her entire life changes. We find that the very reason for being at the well, to have her jug to be filled with water, she actually leaves it behind. Her spiritual jug has been filled and it's overflowing with living water and she has to let other people know then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. We have the woman who went to the well to avoid everyone, is now seeking everyone out with the good news of Jesus Christ. 
This changed life results in the worship of God by introducing people to Jesus, our blessed Messiah. That's what grace does. The same crowd that the same crowd that would have ridiculed this woman, condemned her for her past, these are the same people that this woman is trying that was trying to escape from is now running towards with this great news. The Messiah has come. Now that we have the context of the interaction that Jesus had with this woman at the well, we can further break down Jesus' statement about the change in worship that is coming. Number one, the location of worship does not matter anymore. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Why would this be a significant change that we would not have to journey to Jerusalem in order to worship God? And then, what prompted this change? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. An amazing thing has happened to every New Testament believer. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And so what this means is that when God looks at you today, he doesn't judge you according to your imperfection and, and your flaws. He sees you in Christ. And he sees the blood that has been shed for you by his dear son. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. Because of this, his thoughts toward you are thoughts of loving kindness, blessings, favor, and total forgiveness. Jesus paid an immensely heavy price on the cross so that you can live life completely accepted and unconditionally loved by God. Knowing and believing this will make all the difference in how you live your life. Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, Romans 12, 1. And that is why 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, Therefore, glorify God with your body. Because of what Jesus did and what has happened to you, you are now Holy Spirit filled. So glorify God with your body. Now this phrase, true and proper worship, is a very intriguing phrase. In the Greek, the rendering means pertaining to the spiritual worship. Paul is addressing what worshiping in the Spirit looks like. The temple, the place of worship in the Old Testament, had been destroyed. The Jewish people ethnicity, or those who converted to Judaism, would not be able to worship at the temple any longer. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they responded in verse 20, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? John comments in verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. What did Jesus mean when he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, the material temple would be destroyed. Jesus builds it again in three days in the sense that he now replaces this temple and becomes the new place where everyone may meet God and fellowship with God. Matthew 12, 6 says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And he meant himself. In other words, authentic worship would not be attached to Jerusalem or any other place. We, we tend to do that. We tend to build our own Jerusalems. I can only meet with God at a, at a certain building, at a certain location. No. It will be in spirit and in truth, and it will be attached to Jesus. So number two, the only way to worship God must Worship in the Spirit and in truth. Did you notice the word must there? There's no other way in which we can now worship God. The Greek word translated must 
means it is necessary. Another way of saying this is that you cannot worship God any other way than in spirit and in truth. This just states how important it is to know what it means to worship in the spirit and in truth. Spirit is the word pneuma, meaning the Holy Spirit or one of three parts of a person, a life-giving spirit. So what I believe this means is worship is both through the Holy Spirit, but that it also takes place in our spirit. Some people don't know that we're actually made of three parts. We have body, soul, and spirit. This is clearly identified in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says man is made up of three parts. Spirit is where life comes from. Genesis 2.7 Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, this is God creating our body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You notice how a body without a spirit doesn't have any life. This is evident when a person dies. The spirit leaves the body, and there is no more life. Well, you said, well, I thought it was the soul that leaves the body. No, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. What, what is your soul? We know that there is a divide between soul and spirit because Hebrews 4.12a declares, for the, word of the, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. And Mary said, here's another example, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We can see from Scripture that soul and spirit are different. In this case, Mary's feelings, her mind, caused her to magnify or to celebrate the Lord, which resulted in her spirit rejoicing. Soul. What is soul? Soul, this Greek word, the definition is the seat of the feelings. So it's our feelings our desires, our affections, and our aversions. It can also be translated our mind and our heart. And our soul is actually divided into three parts too. Very interesting. So with the soul, you have our mind, which is our intellect, our emotion, that would be our feelings, and also our will, our decision maker. The soul of man is what is identified as our ego, our personality, our character, and our disposition. Your soul is what makes you unique. Our spirit, though, is the place where we find communion with God. To better understand the three parts of man, we need to look at the Old Testament tabernacle. In the Old Tabernacle of Moses, you'll find that there are three parts to it. You have the outer court, which would represent our bodies, you have um, the holy place, which would be your soul. And then you have the holy of holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was found. God's presence and glory is there. That's the spirit. We have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with God. Our walk and our worship has become much more intimate in the new covenant than it ever was in the Old Covenant. So here's a picture of what I just described. with The outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies, and our body, soul, and spirit. So we worship in spirit or through the spirit, but we also worship in truth. Jesus said, I am the truth, John 14, 6. So the disciples of Jesus were raised in a first century Jewish culture and faith system. So they understood the universally accepted notion that God alone is worthy of our worship. This concept was central to the Ten Commandments. Just have to look at Exodus 20. And it was repeatedly taught throughout Scripture. 
The disciples, like other first century Jewish believers, understood that God alone was to be worshipped. To worship something or someone other than God was to be an idolater, and this violated the first commandment of God. That's why it's amazing that from Jesus' first appearance on planet Earth, he was worshipped as God. The fact that Jesus was worshipped in this way in a culture that demanded and commanded the worship of God alone is a powerful evidence of Jesus' deity. From his first days on earth to his last, Jesus was worshipped as God. Those were in a position to see his power, to hear his teaching, and to witness his resurrection were convinced by what they saw. Jesus himself claimed to be God, John 8, 58. And then he demonstrated the power and authority that belongs to God alone. The disciples responded to worship, even though their Jewish upbringing taught them the dangers of worshiping anything or anyone other than God. The disciples worshiped Jesus without fear because they knew that they were not breaking the commands of God. They knew they were still worshiping the only true God. We can easily be fixated on the word spirit and truth that we miss an important word that comes right before it. The word in. We are to worship in. And this word in is super important. It's a primary preposition denoting a position in place, time, or state, meaning in, by, with, through. And the reason it's so important is it's telling us that this is a fixed place in time. Jesus is telling the woman, a time is coming and has now come. And what this means is that we forever get to worship God in spirit and truth. This will never change. The time has come and it is fixed. One way to think of worship is to think of it as meaning uh, worth Ship. When we worship something, we declare that it is worthy. Psalm 145.3. Now the Greek word used for worship implies an attitude of reverence. Some people think that when they worship God, they're actually giving something to him. But on the contrary, I believe that as we worship and we praise God, he is giving to us. He's imparting his life his wisdom, and his power into our lives. He's renewing our minds and our physical bodies as well as we are in his sweet presence. Worship, then, is simply a response on our part to his love for us. We don't have to, but when we experience his love and his grace in our lives, we want to. It's a response birthed out of a revelation in our hearts of just how great, just how awesome, how majestic, and how altogether lovely our Lord and Savior truly is. As we worship Him and become utterly lost in His magnificent love for us, something happens to us. Our fears, our worries, and our anxieties depart when Jesus is exalted in our worship. I want to thank you for taking the time to once again uh, join us in this series. Once again, not only is this book, The Evolution of Worship, From the Garden to the Gates of Heaven, available on Amazon. Uh, I will put a link to our church website where you can also easily find it for sale there. It's available in hardcover as this copy is, softcover, and also available on Kindle for those that like to uh, read it electronically. So once again, thank you for joining us in this series. We've got plenty more weeks ahead. We're really going to start digging in even deeper into the differences from Old Testament worship to New Testament worship. So God's blessings to you and may your worship, may this series result in you worshiping and rejoicing in your spirit for what Jesus has done for you. Amen.